Board Gosh Energy, proud sponsor of the GAA All Ireland Under 20 and Senior Hurling Championships. Hashtag Hurling to the Core. Hello and welcome to the Throw In Independent.ie's GAA podcast in association with Board Gosh Energy. I'm Will Slattery, delighted to be joined with, as always, by Michael Verdi. Michael, how are things? How is it going, Will? Yeah, good. Uh, All Ireland Hurling final in the books, Limerick. For the second time in three years, are All-Ireland champions uh, after beating Waterford. How did you find the All-Ireland final experience, I suppose, with, with this year of years with, with no fans present? Yeah, it was a little bit different now. Just even, uh, there was no parade beforehand, no meeting the president, you know, none of, none of that kind of noise to greet the teams coming out. It was, it was, definitely, it was definitely different, but no more than anything that we've had, it was, it was great to have it. It was great to have something for people to talk about. And I think probably... You know, the performances from particularly Gerard Hegarty and Tom Morrissey and these guys, they'll be talked about for a long, long time. And I'd say this Limerick team will be talked about for a long, long time too. No, definitely. We're delighted to be joined by John Milan and Ursula Jacob to reflect on yesterday's game. And John, I guess to start, uh, commiserations on the defeat. I know it was always going to be I suppose, a tall ask for Waterford to take on such a strong Limerick side. And when they play like they did yesterday with such a powerful dominant performance, it, it made it probably 10 times, uh, 10 times harder. Uh, how do you reflect on the game, I suppose, on the Monday morning after yesterday? Uh, still, I'm still extremely proud of, of, of the lads. Uh, look, coming off the back of two below power campaigns where we didn't pick up a monster championship win out, out, of, out of nine games. It's been an incredible, it's been an incredible six, seven weeks. And when we when we reflect back on those six or seven weeks, we have won three games. I mean, the game against Kilkenny was was epic. But you know, I think we've got to take great solace that we were just beaten by an exceptional team yesterday, an awesome team. And the one worry, you know, that I did have going into it that is, I felt that we were going to have to bring what we brought against Kilkenny in the second half and even a bit more for the best part of, of, of 70 odd minutes um, and you know when you when you reflect on yesterday and you reflect on the last two meetings um, where Limerick played both Galway and Waterford I, I said it to Fernie off the record that I felt probably Limerick probably will not getting enough credit for those those two wins uh, and I also said that you know Waterford, it was probably the wrong way for Waterford to go into the go into the final coming off a a, a massive game of that um, against Kilkenny, and then Limerick on the other on 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 the opposite side of the semi final they just about did enough to get over the line in 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 a real uh, battling performance. But overall, I think uh, you know you just got to give massive kudos to to Limerick. They're just an exceptional team. They're an awesome team, and look. They're being talked up now in, in, in the same vein as the, the dubs, uh, Kilkenny of, uh, of the noughties. And look, when, when, you, when they look back in the last three years, yesterday quite easily could have been, could have been three in a row. Uh, and they could, could very easily be going, going for four in a row next year. But uh, look, we've uh, just got to give great credit to Limerick. No, no qualms. I think we probably... As, as I said, leading into this game, I, I felt we probably needed to raise a couple of green flags. And, you know, those couple of early chances that we had through Jack Fagan, Desi got the ball, probably could, could have slipped to the Montgomery. And Stephen Bennett had a couple of opportunities. And, you know, if, if we would have raised those green flags, it uh, might have been a totally different outlook. But, I mean, what can you say? I mean, it's just an exceptional performance by Limerick. Probably yeah. on a par with... Probably on a, probably on a par with the Kilkenny performs of 2008 um, all are in final. Yeah, so I suppose because as John kind of touched on there, it, it completes a, a perfect season for Limerick. 13 games across, you know, three, four competitions, 13 victories, and probably one of the most dominant years of hurling we, we've seen, you know, up there with, you know, those great Kilkenny teams that John touched on. Yeah, you know, Limerick definitely saved their best performance of the year for the final yesterday. And when you look back on it, you know, nine different scores, 24 points from play and just a, a really dominant display from start to finish. Uh, and they'd, you know, players just all over the pitch, you know, ob- you had the obvious players like the Grode Hegarty's, Tom Morrissey's, 
as John, you would have said, you know, Will O'Donoghue midfield got in a mountain of work. But the big thing was they were able to nullify any of the, the big names uh, and the threats that Watford had up in, in the attack. And, you know, Watford went for seven, eight goal chances yesterday. And, you know, it was either the pressure that Limerick's defence applied on him or Nicky Quaid in the goal stood up well for him. But, you know, it's, it's really, when you look back, like this is Kylie's fourth year and it was his 20th championship game with Limerick and he's only lost five. So he's won 15 out of 20 over the past four years. And it just shows their dominance. You know, last year's maybe semi-final um, against Kilkenny was such a, a, a big loss at the time. But I think they're going to build on this year again. Um, you know, they look unstoppable at times when they're in full flow. And even at the start of the year when they pushed Kyle Hayes back into, into the backs, you know, we were questioning, was that the right move? And look how well it's worked out. And they, they seem to have, you know, the players in the bench to back it up if someone's not performing. You know, even Peter Casey when he came on yesterday. And then you think back, you've Ricky, Rich, Richie English, Mike Casey, these guys who are missing this year. And in fairness to Dan Morrissey, you know, he, he he's played exceptional since. Barry Nash has done well. So, you know, when you're when you're looking on now the morning after the All Ireland and you're like, God, is there going to be anyone that's going to stop them in the next couple of years? Because they just do seem to have the strength and depth in that panel. Yeah, and to that point, like two statistics I saw earlier that I found very interesting was that there are eleven players of the starting team who are twenty six or under, which shows their their young age profile, and there are also eleven players of the starting team who are six foot or hot or are taller. So they're you know a bit big men, and there's a lot of them who are young men as well, Michael. And it's funny how dominant they've been in that the sense that even though they've only won two All Ireland since nineteen seventy three, there's this kind of mental when we think of them. We think of them as this already this conquering team who've been around the block for so long, but they're still so young. There's so much more to come from them. Yeah, I think probably one of the main reasons why we think they're going to conquer for so long is like just even I did a piece in Saturday's paper about ending famines. This Limerick team have, have ended loads of famines. They ended a big minor famine uh, when they won the Munster in fourteen or 13, I should say, they ended a big famine at the 21 when they won that in 15 with the league as well. They were the first Limerick team to do back-to-back leagues since the 80s as well. So, like, they just have a winning mentality. Uh, Richie McCarthy, who, who walked away at the end of last year, he was saying that they were in a psychology session with Caroline Curry two years ago, and this is before they've won in All-Ireland. And he, he Richie would be a laid-back kind of a character, and he just kind of said, you know, hopefully we'll win this weekend. And Tom Morrissey just pulled him up straight away and said, no, there's no hope in here, Richie. We're going we're gonna to win this weekend. And they've carried that winning mentality through to senior level. And I just think it's interesting as well, uh, they did so this year in the last three games without scoring a goal and without conceding a goal. And it's almost like this kind of death by a thousand cuts almost. Like they can just, they'll just keep that scoreboard ticking over, ticking over, ticking over. They scored 24 times from play yesterday. 12 of those were from their two half forwards. They've kind of reinvented, Morrissey and Hegarty have kind of reinvented what a half forward is now. There used to be this tankless, horrible role going up and down the wings doing these hard yards. They're still doing all the hard yards, but they're still, they're getting up in attack now as well. And I think Limerick were becoming a bit one-dimensional with everything going to Galan, and all of a sudden, these two guys are the outball so often now. I genuinely think that Kylie and his management team sat down after Kilkenny beat them in the All-Ireland semi-final last year and said, uh, how do we make sure that we're, you know, even less beatable than we are already? And I think it's almost akin to when Jim Gavin and the boys met in the Gibson the day after the day after Donegal beat them in 2014. And I think these putting up huge point tallies and having the ability and the players to do this, I think I think Watford and Mitham are so hard to beat. They already create more scoring chances than any other team. Um, they don't force the issue for goals. They had two shots on goal yesterday. They were both all in the same one instance uh, when Stephen O'Keefe pulled off two saves. And uh, they're just they're routinely clocking up 30 points. John was playing when, when Waterford conceded 30 points, 330 to Kilkenny in tw- 2008, you know, widely regarded as the greatest All Ireland performance of all time. And now Limerick are just clocking up 30 points, you know, at will. They scored 36 points against Clare in the first game. They're going to be so, so hard to beat. And although, although they're wearing green, they don't seem to have that much interest in raising green flags. And nobody can touch them even without scoring goals. It's, it's phenomenal, really. 
Yeah, John, like, how would you kind of assess the performance of their two wing forwards who have just, the last two games have been, you know, absolutely awesome. And even to the point that, you know, Aaron Galan chips in with four from play yesterday and it's almost like an afterthought that it was an add-on to the, to the two guys, seven points from Groot Hegarty from play, five from Tom Marcy. And it was, you know, they were similarly effective against Galway as well. As Michael said, redefining the, the role of the wing forwards. And it's kind of amazing to think that I suppose Hegarty and Marcy are probably 1A, 1B for hurler of the year. It just shows how effective they've been. 23 points they've scored in the last two games from play. I mean, that's just an, an incredible uh, stat. Uh, and not alone that, scoring 23 points from play, throw in how many assists have, have, they, have they set up for, for, for other players. They're up and down that field, but it's just a physicality. I mean, you're looking then, you know, you go in then to midfield, you you Will O'Donnell, another six footer who's just a, a, a monster of a man. Then you go Kyle, you're going back another bit, you're going back to Kyle Hayes, Dermot Burns, Warford, who had an awful lot of aerial success against Kilkenny. You know, it was just, it was, go, it was going nowhere for him yesterday. There was only going to be one winner in the aerial. Um, clashes yesterday and Limerick just totally dominates them. Uh, what they have off to a tee as well is, is the puck outs. Their own puck out and the opposition puck out. We've touched on it before. Clare failed on their own puck out. Tipperary failed in their own puck out. Limerick failed in their own puck out. Galway in the semi-final and again yesterday Waterford struggled on their own puck out. They have it off to a tee um, and look, Mickey Quaid what can we say about him? He's been he's been a breath of fresh air this year. He's been unbelievable on his own pocket. So they have everything covered off to a tee. The physicality is just unbelievable. I was up there yesterday and some of the hits they were putting in was just was scary. It was actually scary, Will. And if you're if you're if you're on if you're an opposing player and you're constantly getting hit after hit after hit, it just gradually just wears you down and that's what it does. You're going into the last ten, fifteen minutes, the war water for down. The ward elects the Galway's down, the tips down, and the clears down. And if that game went on for another ten minutes, yes, they all be a ward for kept on going to the end, which was which was very encouraging to, to, to see. But if the game went on for another ten minutes, minutes yes, you were saying to yourself that Limerick could have could have even went up another gear. And that's the most scary and frightening thing about this Limerick team. Yeah, Ursula, and on the physicality point, interestingly, like they they get, they gave away ten free scores freeze that Waterford scored yesterday and then nine frees against Galway in the semi-final. They seem to almost rather getting in a physical hit and allowing you to get a, a free than allowing you to get a score from play. You know, kind of leaving a mark on a player. There was another maybe, uh, you know, kind of pull of the hurry yesterday who was maybe fortunate not to pick up a card. They do like to leave their mark in that way too. That's it. And I suppose they'll do anything to stop a team from scoring a goal too. And maybe some people will view it as cynical play at times, but... They, they play on the edge, they, you know, and, and that's what Kylie and his backroom team have brought this team as well. And you even look at, John spoke about their physicality yesterday. Uh, Limerick scored 15 points off tur- turnovers alone, whereas Watford only got eight points. So that just shows the hooks, the blocks, the forcing uh, Watford into, you know, making errors and then regaining possession. And that's what, that's really what Limerick have become a, of a team this year, that they're able to just dispossess a player and then go down the field and turn it over and get a score themselves. And right across the, the, the team, right from the corner back, Sean Finn to Mulcahy, Mulcahy in the corner, their physicality and presence around the field is very, very imposing and it's very hard to stop when you see someone of the stature of a Declan Hannan, Dermot Burns, Kyle Hayes running through, it makes it nearly impossible to defend. You know, like, because they're, you know, we, when you look at Watford, like, they've got fine big players as well Kevin Morans, Ty De Barkas, Connor Pronties. But if the ball that's going into the likes of Galan at times yesterday, it makes it impossible then for Connor Prunty and the full back line to defend. And it must have been just a nightmare for them. When, when you see the long deliveries that were going in from the likes of Dermot Burns, Kyle Hayes, um, you know, it's pinpoint accuracy. And then give Galan, Seamus Flanagan, any of these guys half a chance and they'll put it over the bar. Mm-hmm. And Michael, just on the Limerick backroom team for a second, I thought Shane Dowling spoke very interestingly last night talking about Paul Connerk and the influence he's had on, I'm sure most people at this stage would have seen him with the tactics board during the water break, you know, the level of technical detail. And as Shane said last night, like every single drill they do, it's very, it's communicated very clearly 
why they're doing it, what tactical reason they're doing it for. It's not just done for the sake of doing it. And I, I, as I think maybe it was even one of your articles over the weekend, you pointed out that now he's been involved in an All-Ireland success with Clare at senior level, two at Limerick at senior level, under-21 success with, with Clare as well. He's 35 years of age, but his coaching CV is as impressive as anybody's. Yeah, it's absolutely phenomenal. Like, and like I, I had Alan Cunningham. Alan Cunningham was a selector and a coach with them as well. I had him when he was in with Offaly with Ollie Baker, another outstanding coach. You have guys that could probably manage county teams as coaches with county teams. That's the sort of backroom team that, like even Liam Sheedy had a, with, with Tipperary last year, Eamon O'Shea and Dar Egan and Tommy Dunn and even Owen Kelly as well. And Darren Gleeson was involved who was with Antrim yesterday. That's the sort of calibre of guys uh, and ladies that you need around you. Like you look at Caroline Currid's CV now as well and I know she's had a, she had a really difficult, uh, really difficult couple of weeks. Like she's been with, you know, four different All-Ireland winning teams and now twice with Limerick as well as the Dublin footballers, Tyrone footballers and the Tip footballers. That's the calibre of individual that they have there. Uh, just on Canark, um, it, it's funny. I think if you look back, like Limerick could potentially, like if they continue what they're doing now, could go down as you know one of the great, one of the really, really great teams. The other great hurling team that we probably talk about is the Kilkenny team in the noughties. Uh, there was a big football influence to them. With, with Mick Dempsey, I would say basically changed the way that they played and changed the way Hurland was played, particularly with you know these deep lying half forwards. Canuck has done the same. Another football man played football with Limerick, and he's kind of reinvented how Hurland is played now. It's phenomenal. And on the Limerick backroom team, um, it's fair. It's fairly. It's fairly lengthy. Uh, no more than Liam Sheedy said last year that Tip would have to bring two separate buses to the All Ireland final. I think if that was the case, I think Limerick would probably be doing the same. Mm-hmm. Fair, but that's. And in comparison, and John will probably know a bit more about this, but in comparison to what, what Waterford, the backroom team that Waterford have, I'd say Limerick's backroom team is, is, is nearly double. And they literally have the cream of the crop, the best of the best in, in, in every field. And it's probably no coincidence that they're performing as they are in the field as a result of that. They, they have everything in place that, uh, you know, that is needed for elite performance. Mm. And, and John, are you going to come Yeah, and, ju- ju- and, and, and ju- just on Canork, like, and Verney, Verney, you'd echo my words on this. I don't think Kenork got enough credit for when Clare won the All Ireland in 2013. Like, like he was like he, he he's just there in the background. But as, as Verney touched on, his CV is just incredible. He's had minor success for Clare. He had the under 21 success. But I go back to 2013 when Clare won that All Ireland. I don't think he got the credit he deserved. And touching on the, on the backroom team in Limerick, there was a there was a a picture going around last night of their backroom team. I think there must have been about 20 in their backroom team. And, and, and the people that were in their backroom team are saying, my God, like, like where, where, where are all these people coming from? But it's, it's easy to do that when you have the financial backing of, of J.P. McManus to go and implement a backroom team of the quality of, uh, that, that Limerick have and that John Coyley um, can go and call upon. Uh, but look, I I don't know. Look, I just think Canork. Uh, I just think he's he's something else, you know. Just yeah. on, on on JP, I'd say there's a lot of uh, every club in the country is wondering whether this 3.2 million donation is going to come again, and whether every club will have a little bonanza <laughs> before Christmas this year. I'd say. <laughs> yeah, it was generous enough the last time, John. And then just this was on Waterford and where they go from here. Obviously, despite losing yesterday, such a successful season for Liam Call in his first year in charge. Like, what do they need to do to make sure this is a regular occurrence so that they are being able to compete at the top of the game? Well, the county board, number one, need to sit down with Ian Cattle. Um, we're talking about the J.P. Romanis of Limerick. Uh, hopefully, the J.P. G, JP Romanis of, of the Waterfords will um, row in behind the county board, uh, get in touch with Liam Cattle, tie him down to a three-year contract himself with Mikey Bevins. They've done an incredible job. Look what they've done in such a short space of time uh, in twelve months. You know, if 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 he got it, if we got another three years under 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 Liam Cal, Mikey Bevins, I've uh, I, I fully believe that Waterford will be back will be back in an All Ireland final. The one disappointment yesterday for me was the injury to 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 Ty the You know, he's he's he, he's our leader. He's an inspirational leader back there in, in in the back line, and to see that man coming off yesterday, you know, nearly brought a tear to my eye. 
and look, we could be we could possibly be uh, missing him him next year. You know, it, it didn't look good. Possibly the crucial uh, went again. But look, there's there's an awful lot to build upon, build on this year, uh, and and I think Waterford the, look at the end of the day we got beaten by an exceptional team. Probably was going to go down as probably one of the great, probably one of the greatest limit teams of all time, if not the greatest limit team of all time. There's there's something to build on there, uh, and I, but I think Liam Cattle, he was very honest in 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 reflecting in his reflection of, of the match yesterday that you know Waterford need to probably up another level in the strength and condition, and um, but that's not going to happen overnight. I mean, he only has twelve months, but if if we can tie him down himself and Mikey Bevins for the next three years, I've no doubt Waterford will will be back in an order and fine in, in that period of time. Just on what John said there, I think it's interesting as well the fact that this year is rolling into next year. Uh, there's very few, very few opportunities for teams to get like a really proper preseason into them and actually make up those steps that they need to make to get back to Limerick. So you'd have to say that Limerick are like rare and hot favourites going into next year because like usually teams like just say Tipperary uh, going back for 2019 when when Sheedy started like they started you know in November of 2018 and had a serious uh, block of work done before they before they went back into competitive action but the way things are this year it's it's not going to work out like that so I it have to be really really favouring Limerick for next year as well and just on what John said as well with Tyg de Borca as well like the really unfortunate thing is it looks like he'll potentially miss the 2021 season and the timing of Parik Mahoney's injury means that he could potentially miss the bulk of the 2021 season as well so there that's two tough blows yeah and, and the, the only worry I, I have will uh, with Waterford you know they're going back in three or four weeks time to go at it again uh, for the league like I mean, how do you how do you pick those lads up in, in three or four weeks' time? You know, coming off a, an All Ireland defeat, and, and look, I I seen with my own two eyes what type of effort they put into a lot of their their training sessions, and you know to go and ask, you know, those lads to to go again in three or four weeks' time. I think it's going to be an easier job for 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 John Coyley. I think lads will be jumping out of their seats to, 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 go, to go back and to go back at it again and to go out, push on and try and, and win the next trophy but you know I'd just like to ask him probably Verney and, and Ursula you know what way what way do you think the Waterford approach would be from Liam Cattle in, in regards to picking the lads up you know Yeah well one thing I just think you know because the next year's season is going to start so quickly I do think you know, even Limerick, I know they're going to be on such a high at the moment, but you need the mental break from it too. You know, the last couple of weeks have been so intense. You know, you've played, you know, a lot of high quality games in, in a five or six week period. And whether you're winning or losing, obviously it's that bit easier when you're winning and you're, you're reaping all the uh, rewards. But going into next year, it can make the year quite long if you don't actually take uh, a three, four, five week break from it because if not it's going to be hard to sustain those high levels that you know John Kiley will expect from his players and the same John as you said like Liam Cahill is going to uh, expect from his guys as well and if they're trying to play catch up you know whether it's from strength and conditioning or whatever um, you know that's going to be very difficult but the one positive for Watford is if if things you know like this year was a little bit disruptive for the likes of Liam Cahill too you know it was his first year in charge he was wanting to put his own stamp and marker on the team. And for three, four or five months, he wasn't, you know, there on the training pitch with these guys. So I think that will stand to Waterford in 2021. But I definitely think, from my own experience, I think when you're coming off a defeat like that, you you need to take a, 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 a specific uh, break away from the game for maybe three, four or five weeks and then reset and look forward to next year. Mm, and Michael, I know John talked about it there. John Coyley after the game, like he seemed as hungry as anyone to to get back uh, training and and to get back looking at twenty twenty one. There definitely is a sense that it is the beginning. It isn't just oh we've great we've won two and three years. This is our great team. It's let's make it two in a row, three in a row. You know, I, I don't think Limerick have won back to back All Irelands uh, or, or not for a long, long time if they have. So there's a lot of incentive still there to keep going. Yeah, they were beaten in '74, I think, going for going for back to back. He's just so hungry. Every trophy that they can win, 
he wants to win, be it a, you know, a Munster co-op league or the Munster or the league or the All-Ireland, they want to win everything. Uh, kind of like Hallmarks and probably the Great Kilkenny team or even Dublin now, anything that's available to them, they'll win it. They'll try and win it. And I suppose with, like that, that winning habit as well, winning breeds winning. They, and they, they're kind of gaining a foothold and a, str- a stranglehold on teams by beating them in the Munster Co-op, by beating them in the league, by beating them in Munster, by beating them at the All-Ireland. And they become even more formidable as a result of that. Like, like it, was, it was great to see. It's great to see a manager showing the emotion that he did after even lifting the cup. And you can see the, the, you can see the love that his players have for him and obviously that he has for his players as well. So... They're mad to go. They're very, very hungry for action again. And just on what John said there, and even to echo what Arsenal said, very, very difficult. You want a mental and physical break. And it's not really, really going to come, to be honest with you. Like, I don't know. I don't know if JP will get them away to Barbados this year or, or, what, or what, what the scenario is. I, I, believe, I, be, I believe Barbados is, um, Barbados is was COVID free there for a long time. So may, maybe he will on a, on a private jet. But uh, it's, a, it's, a different type of, it's a different type of a thing uh, coming into next year's championship. But yeah, def, definitely all signs which suggest, be it the way they play, their age profile. Everything suggests the way they've been coached and managed that Limerick are here for a long, long time. And it's probably, I'd say there's a dynasty coming here with this side. Yeah, well, certainly it's what's been threatened at the moment. And John, just before we let you go, I suppose now that the 2020 Championship has come to a close, you know, what's kind of your standout memory from it? Or when you look back on it, obviously it was, it was so good to get it to go ahead, first of all, in what was such a strange year for everyone. You know, what, what are you going to remember from this campaign? Ah, look, for me yesterday... Uh, to be there the Joe McDonough watching the Joe McDonough final and look the last couple of weeks uh, to watch you know the Dubs Tipperary go over to the corner Crow Park you know Leah Reese um, in honour the, the bloody Sunday I, I was strange I, I nearly started crying when, when, when Andrew went door and that music came on and it's just it's, it's just the just the pride in, in the organisation that we are a part of. I mean, there was an awful lot of people saying, you know, giving out about the GE and look, we got a bit of bad press after the, the, the club campaigns. You know, things got a bit out of hand with, with some of the celebrations. But the last six, seven weeks have just been magical. Absolutely magical. It's been so uplifting for the whole country. And, you know, it, it answers all the questions. Should this championship win the head? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, look at, look at the... Look at the joy that it brought to everyone. I mean, the joy that it brought the award for people. You know, albeit we lost yesterday, but I'll never forget that that Saturday night at home, you know, with my family watching that Kilkenny game. It was just unbelievable. And, you know, it's, it's after Sean in our winter. And it's after Sean in our winter, you know, it's, it's Christmas is upon us. Um, but it's just, you know, the the pride of being involved in such an organisation and, and how how everyone conducted themselves over the course of the course of the six, seven weeks, um, even how Crow Park went about their business. You know, and even yesterday, you know, John Coyley, Declan Hannon's speech was just incredible. Uh, and you know, it's it's when we, when we reflect on twenty twenty, you know, it's been a bleak year, but we can look back and say, you know what? We're part of a fantastic organisation, and I think we're we're part of probably the best organisation in the world. And a massive kudos to everyone uh, that we 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 got the championship up and running, and we got it finished uh, in the one year. Um, and it's over to the Dubs and Mayo next week to, to finish it off. Well, John, hard luck in the result yesterday, but thanks so much for joining us over the last couple of weeks. No bother, man. Fair play, to you. Cheers. Thanks, John. Well, Michael, obviously there was another game played yesterday as well, and that was the curtain raiser of the John McDonough Cup final. Antrim uh, narrowly beating Kerry, and it was a very competitive game in the end. Uh, what did you make of the match? Yeah, no, in fairness to, to Antrim, they probably should have been further ahead. They should have been further, uh, I'm not going to say further ahead. They were actually behind at half time, amazingly. They totally out hurled uh, Kerry at various stages in the first half. They were unlucky uh, with that. Well, not unlucky. It was. I think the rim of the ball was the only thing that what that wasn't over the line. So it probably definitely wasn't a goal. But they they out hurled uh, Kerry in the first half, and then they came out in fairness to them in that kind of moving quarter, the third quarter. Uh, Antrim didn't score, or Kerry didn't score for the first fifteen minutes of that quarter, and the game was kind of over. While they were probably only kind of hanging on at the end, they were they've been the best side 
shout out to Joe McDonough. They obviously, this is the fourth time they've beaten Kerry this year. They beat them in the Division 2A League final as well. And I think, uh, with due respect to Kerry, and uh, they've after making massive progress because they were only, they played awfully in a game last year, and last game in a Joe McDonough, and it was the loser went down to Christy Ring, and all of a sudden they're, they've jumped ahead and they're into a final. They've had massive strides, but I think Antrim are the best equipped team from the McDonough the whole way throughout the year to go into the Leinster Championship next year. Um, and I think it was, that was a really good performance. And uh, like I kind of mentioned uh, throughout the year that they were doing so, playing really well without Neil McManus. And it was just, it was his probably steady and influence yesterday. Mm. Just when they needed a bit of experience and a cool head, he was able to come in, you know, with 25 minutes to go and really, really settling them down. And Darren Gleeson is making a fair old commute uh, up from Port Roo up to, <laughs> up, to, up to Antrim a couple of times a week. So it's, it's definitely paid off. And his first year as manager, he's probably accomplished, you know, what anyone would have hoped to accomplish in two or three years up there between getting up to Division One hurling and getting up to the Leinster Championship. And I think the fact that they have Division One hurling before they play what could be around Robin and Leinster is huge for them because they'll probably have had some time to acclimatise to it. But yeah, huge win for them. And you saw Ursula, like those the celebrations afterwards with Darren Gleeson kind of leading them on. Yeah. It shows how much it means to him. And as Michael says, what an achievement in his first year. That's it. And it was brilliant that it was played on, you know, the big stage before the, the Waterford Limerick game as well. And it was great that they were playing in Crow Park and as Michael said you know you were kind of looking on in the first half and you were thinking Antrim were well in control and then I suppose Kerry got that fortuitous goal but credit to Matthew Donnelly full back you know he recovered really well after that and actually had a really great game Uh, and you know he didn't really let much pass him then in the second half but key for me was the subs you know as Michael alluded to you know Neil McManus getting having a player like him in in the bench you know to come on score four points but he, he definitely steadied the ship and even Connor Cunning, Niall McKenna got a couple of super points in the second half. And I just, I suppose they had a bit more strength and depth in the, in the panel in the end. You know, Kerry were very much reliant on, um, you know, uh, Shane Conway for the scores and the freeze. But look, at, uh, it's great to see Antrim now up, up to the next level. And no doubt Darren Gleeson will be fully aware that, you know, the performance yesterday probably wouldn't, do much at a higher level, but you have to give credit for them. They they've been unbeaten this year in the league and the Joe McDonough, so uh, they fully deserve the win. Just on what Ursula said there, I think some of the commentary after the game, just that like yeah. talking about next year, like it, no more than Kilkenny in the Camogie, like it, it they just wanted to win the game. Yeah. It, it wasn't about delivering this you know five star performance. So I think I, I'm not sure if some of that commentary was fair. They'll be a different team next year if you take. Yeah their games as a whole, the whole way through to McDonough, like they were, they were really good. That probably wasn't their best performance, yeah. but their, their main objective was to get over the line and, and they did. And a win is a win. So yeah. at the end of the day, they, they'll be happy enough. And just to finish up with the John McDonough, Michael, uh, you know, Ursula mentioned it there. It was great that it was the curtain raiser to the main final to get those players the exposure and, the, and like kind of just the kudos of playing in Croke Park. Is that something you think should be looked at going forward? It really does add to the occasion, I, I feel. Yeah, uh, I, w- I was always a fan of the minor games when played before the senior final. But I think when it went down to, to under 17, I'm not sure. And it's a, it's a lot of pressure, I think, for young fellas at that age. Like you could, you could have a 15-year-old playing on All-Ireland final day. I'm not sure if, if as much intrigue or interest is in the minor game now. Maybe as a result of that, I think it's been diluted somewhat. So I think like it's, it's, the, se- it's the second biggest final that's going to be played every year. It should, it should be on All-Ireland final day, I think. Very interesting, actually, to see. I, th- I think it's cool kind of now, just because maybe lads aren't out celebrating as much, that you see lads interacting on social media last night. And James McNaughton, the, the Antrim forward, son of the great Sambo, had a tweet out last night about uh, he can't wait to play Limerick in the Super Cup final. So <laughs> they'll, get, they'll, get, uh, they'll get plenty of chances to play Limerick and all the other big teams next year. Yeah. Well, just moving on, I suppose, to the Camogie final as well, Ursula. You know, a great occasion for Kilkenny, as you mentioned. You know, just getting over the line after losing three previous finals was huge. And I suppose Galway did go in as favourites. Like, it, you have to say, I suppose it's not often you kind of look back and say, oh, you know, Kilkenny really, need, you know, they didn't need another one. But, like, after the heartbreak of the last few years, it was great yeah. to see them get over the line. Without a doubt, you know, it was their seventh final in 10 years and they had only one victory in those seven finals. So, to, you know, they fully deserved it yesterday or on Saturday night. Um, you know, right from the start, defensively, they were very strong. Uh, for me, uh, Kilkenny got the matchups right. You know, they nullified the main players. Uh, 
you know, Neve Kilkenny and Aoife Donoghue for Galway would have been a really important pairing for, for Galway last year in their victory in the final. And Kellyanne Doyle and Anna, and Anna Farrell midfield were excellent throughout. They didn't give them an inch. Um, the main threats, obviously, for Galway were the two McGrath sisters, but Kilkenny soon got on top of it. You know, you saw Grace Walsh pushing up the field, getting a point. She she was excellent throughout, clear feeling in the full back line. But for me, it was some of the maybe lesser known players up in the attack. Aoife Doyle, who got player of the match, four points. Mary O'Connell, Katie Nolan. These were the girls who came maybe in under the radar. Maybe all the focus and attention was on the likes of Anne Dalton, Miriam Walsh, Denise Gall. But when Kilkenny needed, you know, the extra 10, 15% maybe that they were missing in other years, these young girls stepped up. Maybe the, 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 the whole occasion, you know, the fact that there was no crowd, the build-up wasn't as, you know, big and there wasn't all the outside distractions suited Kilkenny. Um, but definitely the, the penalty Denise Gall got, you know, was so vital for their win. Uh, Denise was so cool and calm taking it as well, but she really just buried it in the back of the net and they fully deserved their victory. Um, you know, their performance in the semi-final was excellent. They showed massive character uh, and resilience to come back from that six-point deficit at the start. Um, and I think they had a major point to prove. You know, they were probably written off all year, especially when they were missing some really big name players, the likes of Katie Power, who we've, we've mentioned in, in the past, Michelle Quilty, uh, Edwina Keane. Like they, they, they were missing five big players from last year's final and the new girls that slotted in just performed uh, excellently in the final. Yeah, and a new manager as well. I, I think he, when he was speaking afterwards, he he talked a lot about how how much those losses, Michael, had re, had really taken its toll on the team. And then you know, come down to, to a penalty from Denise Gall at the end, like the pressure she must have felt as she stood stood up to address that ball must have been huge. Yeah, and in fairness, like Brian Dowland was obviously involved as coach with Anne Downey last year. Great to hear, actually. Anne was on Kilkenny Community Radio, going absolutely, you know, she just <laughs> lost it after. In fairness to her, I messed it. her afterwards as well on the pitch. <laughs> I'd say that was interesting. Now, yeah, like she absolutely, you know, she bleeds black and amber, particularly yeah. on the Camo- on the Camogie side of things. And in fairness, like particularly when, when Ursula says about all the players that they're missing there, to keep going back to the grindstone, all those players over and over again, like. When you, when you win, it's so much easier to go back the next year. Uh, yeah. Anthony Daly said to me there just last week, he was talking about Clare in 95. He said they've been beaten so often. He said him and uh, PJ O'Connell sat down for dinner on the Thursday night before the Munster final. And PJ Fingers O'Connell asked Dalo, was he coming back next year if they got beaten? And he said no. And he was 25 years old. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the same. And like he goes on to Captain Clare to win two All Ireland. It's it's yeah. so much easier to go back when you're winning. And, and fair play to for the Kilkenny girls to keep going back. And particularly, especially, it's great to see the, the scenes with Katie Power after, just yeah. to see how how much it, how much it means to them all. And in fairness, a couple of things on the other night. Like it it wasn't the greatest final in the world, but I definitely think the rule changes have made uh, Camogie an awful lot easier on the eye. At least like, you can you can throw in a physical tackle now. Yeah. The referee wasn't blown for everything. I think even the fact that you can't probably hand pass the goal now as well. Just, yeah. I just think I just think it's uh, it's more aesthetically pleasing now. And games aren't going to be decided by you know uh, was this a barge here or was this a shoulder yeah. here and teams like starting over freeze to win games. So, uh, well, fair fair play to Kilkenny. Yeah, uh, all the uh, all the heartbreak will be long forgotten now. And just on, on Grace Walsh as well. Uh, it seems like two or three years ago since it happened, but. Her four brothers won uh, all Ireland titles with Tuller Owen earlier on this year. So she completed the family set in 2020. They all won all Ireland in Crow Park. And uh, that famous red helmet that Tommy, yeah. Tommy used to bomb out with balls. In fairness, she, uh, she definitely kept the family tradition going well. She got a great score there as well in the second half. She was outstanding. And they'll yeah. be known as Grace's brothers from now on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And there's a Jonah come in on Michael's point about some of the rule change because I suppose after some of the finals in recent years, a lot of the conversation was about you know refereeing incidents and and maybe the how the the, yeah. the sport was developing in general. Yeah, and I I just think it's a, a, it's such a sense of relief that we're now we're actually talking about the game and the scores and the skill level rather than about maybe a refereeing decision. And credit to Owen Elliott, I think he's probably the top the top referee in the Camogie um, Association at the moment and he let the game flow but definitely the rules have have worked brilliantly this year like I I'm I was a fo- I'm a forward for the last 20 plus years and I never liked the hand pass rule so I'm delighted that's gone 
but even the physicality, you know, the girls are, are, are doing the strength and conditioning and trainings. They're able to deal with the, the, the few hits. Like it's not that we're encouraging dirty play or anything like that, but you're allowing the flow of the game that bit better. And, you know, it's not a stop start. Uh, you know, it's a lot more aesthetically pleasing and right throughout this year's championship. And when the games have been live streamed this year, it's great that Camogie has been show, showcased in such a positive manner. So I definitely think that the rules will stay. You know, they they were being trialed throughout the league and championship this year, but I definitely will hope that they'll continue to to stay the same because I think it'll only enhance the, the, the game of Camogie. Yeah, and I suppose at the start of the year or halfway through, it didn't look likely we'd get any championship. Now we have the hurling and the Camogie in the books and they've been really, really good, I suppose, to take people's mind off of 2020 generally over the last few weeks. Ursula, Michael, thanks so much for joining me. That's all we have time for this week on the Throw-In Podcast in association with Board Gosh Energy. Thank you so much for listening. We'll be back later in the week with an all out football final preview. In the meantime, you can subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, or listen on independent.ie. So until later in the week, thanks for listening and goodbye.